And now it's my very special privilege to introduce to you a true statesman of the global church, one of the most influential Christian leaders of our time, of all time, the man who gave a stirring address in our baccalaureate service just last evening. This morning we've asked Dr. Ravi Zacharias to take a few moments to remind us all of the one for whom we're here, our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome, Dr. Ravi Zacharias. Mr. Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, members of the faculty, staff, and graduating students, what a distinct honor it is for me to be here once again to share for just a few minutes on some thoughts that I think will be pertinent as you move on into the next stage of your life, especially for those of you graduating. I'm a Christian apologist. Apologetics is the discipline that does two things. It clarifies truth claims, and it gives answers to the hard and the soft questions that people ask. So we are surrounded all around us in our ministry with questions. It was uh, two or three years ago, I just arrived, I think I landed from Bangkok into Newark, New Jersey, and my plane was a little delayed and I rushed over to the gate and I looked at the marquee and it gave the name of a city that wasn't matching my boarding card. I was heading to Atlanta, which is home. So I just looked at a lady sitting in the corner and I said, excuse me, is this plane going to where it says, or is it heading to Atlanta? She says, it's going to Atlanta. I said, thank you very much. And I was walking away. I heard the patter of feet behind me. And then she tapped me on the shoulder. She said, excuse me, are you Ravi Zacharias? I said, I'm afraid so, I am. She said, I'm amazed. I didn't know you had questions as well. <laughs> That's a true story, I didn't make it up. I said, that is one of the simplest questions I have ever asked. Where is this plane headed? A few weeks ago, I was doing an open forum at Princeton University and a gentleman stood up. He asked a very interesting question. He said this, what is the difference in the milieu and the ideas in the original creation in the garden, if you will, he said, over against now? I said, boy, that's a long question. Let me keep the answer brief. I said two things. I said, number one, the presence of God. And number two, I said, if you remember, in the legal framework, there was just one prohibition and one temptation. Think of that. You shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just one caution, one warning, one law to bear in mind. What happens? The enemy of our souls comes and what does he say? Did God really say that? Is this a propositional statement from God? And then the seduction. In the day that you eat of it, you know, you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. I take that to mean in the day that you defy the one mandate of God, not to define good and evil, Everything wrong will ensue. So all that happened in that garden was simply the denial of God's prerogative to be the definer of good and evil. And when you look at the world now, I said to the student, you tell me, what does the world look like now with thousands of laws, thousands of footnotes, and even when you get onto the plane, they don't just tell you don't mess with the fire, with the smoke detector. They have to tell you not to tamper, touch, disable, or destroy. <laughs> because you can have each word dying the death of a thousand qualifications. What's really happened, ladies and gentlemen, we are living at a time in cultural history where our definitions have gone. Our definitions have gone. Malcolm Muggeridge talked about this years ago in the 70s. He said it is difficult to resist the conclusion that 20th century man has decided to abolish himself. Tired of the struggle to be himself, he has created boredom out of his own affluence, impotence out of his own erotomania, and vulnerability out of his own strength. He himself blows the trumpet that brings the walls of his own cities crashing down. 
until at last having educated himself into imbecility, having drugged and polluted himself into stupefaction, he keels over a weary, battered old brontosaurus and becomes extinct. You know, the truth of the matter is, when our definitions are gone, the minefield and the quicksand through which we walk is horrendous. Now you may say Mugridge was on the verge of his own spiritual journey beginning. Here's a humanist, Aldous Huxley. We are living today not in the delicious intoxication of the early successes of science, rather in the grisly morning after, where it has become quite apparent that what science may have actually done is to introduce us to improved means in order to obtain hitherto unimproved or rather deteriorated ends. In Moscow last week, I told them the story of Natan Sharansky, who was a political prisoner there for many years, then went on to his homeland in Israel, became the justice minister. When he returned to the Russia for the first time, he asked if he could go back to the prison, Lefortovo prison, where they kept him for so long. As he was about to enter, enter that little cell, he asked his wife if she would please allow him the privilege of being there alone for a few minutes. He went back alone, and he came back, tears running down his face. He said, it was here that I really found myself. And he asked for the privilege to go and wreath, lay a wreath at the tomb of the, the grave of Andrei Sakharov, the great Russian physicist who gave to the Soviet Union the atomic bomb. And he quoted Sakharov and he said this, Sakharov told me before he died, I always thought the most powerful weapon in the world was the bomb. He said it is not. The most powerful weapon in the world is the truth. Winston Churchill said, the truth is the most valuable thing in the world, so valuable that it is often protected by a bodyguard of lies. By a bodyguard of lies. Where do we go from here? What do we do when those in their punditry have told us years ago where we were headed? Where is America now? Listen to Chesterton. Under the smooth legal surface of our time, there are already moving very lawless things. We're always near the breaking point when we care for only what is legal and nothing for what is lawful, unless we have a moral principle about such delicate matters as marriage and murder. The whole world will become a welter of exceptions with no rules, and there will be so many hard cases that everything will go soft. Unless we know the difference between what is lawful and what is legal. Where do we go? Where do we go? I close with this thought. It was about three years ago for the first time I was given that awesome privilege of speaking at the opening day of the United Nations in their day of prayer. They asked me to speak on a very difficult subject, the finding of absolutes in a relativistic world. That's tough on any given day, even tougher in 20 minutes at about seven o'clock in the morning. 6.30 or 7. What, are, what could you do where there's a plurality of worldviews sitting in front of you? So I did this. I said, we are looking for absolutes in four areas. Evil. How do you define evil? Justice. How do you define what is just? Love. How do you find the source of love and the absoluteness of love? And when we blow it, we look for the grounds of forgiveness. These are the areas that govern our lives for which we want definitions. Evil, justice, love, and forgiveness. Sitting at the edge of their seats now, I had to be careful. I said, ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you this? Do you know of the one place in history where these four converge? The one place in history where evil, justice, love, and forgiveness come down to that funnel, the end of the funnel. I said, there is, in the Christian worldview, it happened on a hill called Calvary. The evil that is in the heart of man, the justice that God has, the love that he portrayed to the very end, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing, the forgiveness that we found. At the age of 17, I was on a bed of suicide in New Delhi, India, having lost all hope. A 
total failure. When a man brought me a Bible into my hospital room, something I'd never opened in my own life. And he opened it to John chapter 14. And I won't go into details. He gave it to my mother, whose English was not that good, reading from the King James Version, because he had to leave. Jesus said to Thomas, because I live, you also shall live. I committed my life to Jesus Christ, and the grand weaver has drawn a grand pattern in the life of somebody who'd lost all hope, lost meaning, lost purpose. You see, when you find your definitions in God, you find the very purpose for which you were created. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in him. Can I close with this quote? In 1939, the world was on the brink of a lot of darkness. King George VI went to speak to the world and he said this, I said to the man at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may walk safely into the unknown. He said to me, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. It shall be to you better than the light and safer than the known. Graduates, you're going out into a pretty dark world. Put your hand into God's hand. Know his absolutes. Demonstrate his love. Present his truth. And the message of redemption and transformation will take hold. The story is to be told to many. And the experience and joy of transformation is unique. The gospel alone has that story. I pray God's blessing on this university, sir. May he give you your best days ahead and what an honor you've given me in order to be able to come here and share. May God richly bless you. Go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. Thank you.